We have discussed how to make a case for the originality of your research and the role of the research problem in making that case. Now we return to how to make a case for the value of your research. Many scholars do their research primarily because it interests them. But when it's time to get it published, they have to convince the readers that it is important. They have to answer the so what question. The introduction is where you set up the answer for that question. We have to face the fact that most research is on small, narrowly defined problems. It's just not important in and of itself. So the challenge in writing an introduction is to convince readers that the small problem you have been working on has implications for a larger problem that people in your field think is important. This is why most introductions begin by establishing the value context for the research, that is, the broader problem that can be affected by a solution to the smaller problem. So an introduction should establish that value context, usually in the first sentence of the paper. And then later in the introduction, you should show how solving your research problem has implications for that broader problem. This is usually done right after stating the research problem. So this is what the case for value looks like in the overview of the introduction. It begins by establishing the value context and providing a brief review of the literature that supports the importance of that context. It then returns to that context after the statement of the research problem. It is at this point in the introduction that you make your case that solving your particular research problem is important because it has implications for solving the broader problem that is always already recognized as important. To try to make it clearer how researchers can convince readers of the importance of a small project by placing it in the context of a broader value context, let's look at an example. In this example, two researchers are studying the function of the CX3CL1 chemokine in a particular area of the brain of rats. This chemokine appears to play a role in the work of the neurotransmitter serotonin, also known as 5-HT. So what we have here is a research project that is very narrowly defined. On its own, it's difficult to see the importance of it. How could our researchers get this research published? They decide on what their value context will be and establish it in the first sentence of their article. Psychological stress alters immune responses and confers vulnerability to a wide spectrum of autoimmune, cardiovascular, and neurological diseases. So we've gone from the CX3CL1 chemokine that the research is about to a broad problem of psychological stress in various diseases. This is an issue that most people in the field would think is an important one. Then in the next sentence, our researchers narrow the value context a bit by setting up the link between the broader value context and their research. The neurotransmitter serotonin, 5-HT, has an important role in the neuronal response to stress, and dysfunction of the 5-HT is characteristically associated with stress-related psychiatric disorders, including depression and anxiety. As we see, the researchers introduce the problem of serotonin dysfunction to make a clear connection between the stress-related disorders caused by that dysfunction and the broader psychological stress in the first sentence. This is the beginning of a process that directs the article toward the CX3CL1 chemokine and establishes its importance related to addressing stress-related psychiatric disorders. So after a brief review of the literature related to the interactions of serotonin with the immune system and a longer literature review of what is known about the role of chemokines in serotonin production, our researchers have set the stage for their presentation of the research problem and making a case for the importance of solving their research problem. 
Here is the research problem presented in its classic form. It starts with a negative turn establishing a contrast to what is known, and then it identifies the gap in what is known. Although chemokines are expressed in the brain, little is known about chemokine regulation of the 5-HT neuronal functions. The next sentence is critical to the overall case for the importance of the research. In it, the researchers explicitly describe uh, the importance of solving res the research problem by returning to the value context set up at the beginning of the introduction. It connects the research on CX3 CL1 chemokine to that value context. An impact of the chemokines including CX3CL1 on the 5-HT system would have implications for stress-reduced immunological dysfunction as well as our understanding of anxiety and the depressive disorders associated with immune disorders. Notice that to make the move back to the value context clearer, they use specific words from the second sentence of the introduction. Here you see the repeated terms highlighted. The broader implication is that this research has value for addressing the autoimmune, cardiovascular, and neurological diseases identified in the first sentence. Finally, in the last sentence of their introduction, our researchers provide a preview of their research. In the present study, we examine the neuroanatomical relationship between CX3CL1 and the 5-HT system, as well as the functional impact of CAX3CL1 on 5-HT neurons using the whole cell patch clamp recordings in an in vitro rat brain. Research introductions typically end with a brief description of the research that was done to solve the research problem. Having this description at the end of the introduction serves as a transition to the rest of the article. In the traditional thesis, whose introduction is the first chapter, the preview is usually an overview of the following chapters. This is usually at the very end of that chapter. <clears throat> when you look at the scholarly introduction as a whole, it is structured from general to specific. It starts with the broad value context and through a chain of progressively specific concepts and then and ends up with the particular research that was done. You can see this progression from general to specific in the overview of the introduction from the value context to the, to the specific research that is to be described in the, in the article. Whereas the structure of introductions is from general to specific, the structure for discussions reverses that structure. Discussions typically go from the specific findings of the research to the broad value context. What is in the introduction creates an expectation in the reader for what will be in the discussion. Let's conclude this workshop by returning to its title, How to Write a Scholarly Introduction. Now that you know what the main elements of the introduction are, I'll describe a process you can use for drafting your introductions. You begin by defining the research problem, the most important part of the introduction. Then you build the introduction around the research problem. After establishing a value context, you can draft the literature reviews for that context and for the area of research of the project. Then you formalize the research problem with a negative turn and a statement of the gap in what is known. You complete the case for value by showing how solving the research problem is important within the value context. Finally, you draft the preview of the research. This process will enable you to make strong cases for originality and value of your research.